to another of the post-coronavirus lectures on sociological theory. Uh, this video is on uh, Skeleton Key to Sigmund Freud's Mass Psychology in Analysis of the Ego. Now, the English translation usually uses group psychology. I much prefer the German uh, mass psychology. It much uh, better captures the concerns that Freud has in the book. He really is interested in almost anything except an organized group, as he tells us uh, along the way. The, the phenomena that he's interested in analyzing are crowds, uh, masses, political masses, political movements, political followings, um, you know, to a much lesser degree, something like, you know, political mobs in cities and those kind of things. Um, but he's using um, and, and critiquing uh, primarily French writing about crowds and crowd behavior and crowd psychology. And what he's going to tell us is, is that there is no particular need for a separate field of crowd psychology and that um, his psychoanalytic model is fully sociological and is fully capable of accounting for the problem of political movements and, you know, um, the loss of individuality and the loss of sort of democracy in the modern world. So it's a, it's a very good document and um, one that I think, again, really important. You know, my own reading of the of, of this book began in this collection, this Britannica uh, great book series that I bought, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. Really tiny, thin pages. Um, but this this particular essay is so marked up, it's almost unreadable. I mean, the whole book is. But but I've read this this article for over 20 years. It's um, or this book for over 20 years. I've taught it for at least 10. Um, and I, again, it's really important. I think it is probably, along with Totem and Taboo, the books that launched uh, critical social theory in the direction that it ultimately took with the Frankfurt School. So mass psychology, um, you know, the term is really used by, uh, uh, by, uh, by Wilhelm Reich in, in his sort of er document of the, of the Frankfurt School, the, the mass psychology of fascism. Um, so it's a very good follow-up, by the way, to, to this lecture. Let's look at a couple of images to get started here. Okay, so Freud is really interested in political movements, crowds, crowd behavior, that kind of thing, right? All right, and one of the things that the other uh, theorists of crowd psychology emphasize is that there's something unique when human beings get in a crowd, like they lose critical distance separating themselves from others. They begin to engage in something called imitation. So they just sort of mill around like cows in a herd. So you get the herd instinct is one of the terms that's used here. Um, or the concept of the crowd or the group mind, right? Something like when people get in a group, they lose their individuality, their individual psyche goes away, and they seem to be possessed by an alien force. And then they act as a political block or as a kind of mobilizing block, an action block, um, and so on. Freud is going to do something that the other theorists of crowd psychology um, failed to do. And that is he is going to locate the primary influence of the members of a crowd. Um, it isn't really influence of crowd member to crowd member. The influence is almost always from the leader to the followers in the crowd. And so when you get, so uh, in essence, what he says is, is that a political leader with a political follower is essentially a two-person crowd, and then you get a massification of those, and you wind up with, you know, um, with with the acting crowds of, of, of politics. So again, this is North Korea, uh, and you know, in authoritarian regimes, they're going to tell us about the authoritarian qualities of crowd rulers or of the furor of of, of masses. So you see this in many, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes. The leader is usually put up on high on a block, on a balcony or something like that, surrounded by other symbols of power. But the leader has this function of being someone to whom the following relates. And so there's generally this strong emotive flow of energy between the leaders and the followers. And to Freud, that becomes really important. So here's the image we'll be kind of coming back to. Um, this is Freud's essential uh, drawing basically of the mass psychology of of, uh, of crowds that it is that each member of the crowd is a follower who develops an emotive strong emotive uh, uh, even sometimes sexually charged relationship uh, with the leader often unconsciously sexual but there you go right so it is the leader follower relationship 
that becomes essential. Many people who read Freud think that it's really all about leaders and the qualities of authoritarian leaders. When you read the book carefully, the entire book is really about the psychology of the sole member of the mass or the crowd, the political follower, right? It's the follower that he's interested in. So the leader is really um, a, a kind of, you know, projection or incorporation of fantasy or something like that. The leader doesn't even need to have a particular um, set of qualities as to what the follower Im imputes to them. So a political following, a mass, uh, 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 um, is really what he's interested in here. So that's the image that we're going to get to. So I have not seen this so strongly in America as we're seeing right now. This image was taken yesterday. So I'm recording this in early October. Uh, Donald J. Trump uh, has just released himself from the hospital uh, after basically infecting himself with COVID because of his failure to practice uh, any kind of um, precautionary uh, measure. And we know right now that his immediate following, the people around him, are falling uh, in, in, in large numbers to the virus as well because like their leader, they viewed the virus as largely a hoax and wouldn't take it seriously, at least not publicly. They were sending out this image publicly that the virus didn't exist or wasn't a hoax. So Trump has been attempting to project strength, not disease. And so yesterday he ripped off his mask and stood on the balcony of the White House to essentially have his image projected around the world as a figure of strength and domination. Now this is going to be important. This turns out to be something that Freud thinks is really important about mass furors or mass leaders, that they're people who always try to project uh, strength, right? They always try to project strength. And the idea is, is that in order to rule a mass, you know, you must be strong. All kinds of weakness, all kinds of kindness are, are, are abhorrent and that you must be, be strong. And that you also must sort of convey a sense of love to your following. So the reason why the great leader, the Fuhrer, stands in front of the following is because of the love that flows between the leader and the follower, the leader and the follower. And Donald Trump, as we're going to talk about a little later here, I hope, uh, often tells his crowds, I love you, right? I mean, he actually has said this just in that phrase, I love you. And we know that the following of Trump often projects love back. So this is also from just a couple of days ago, right before Trump fell. This is in Minnesota. He was dancing, I think, to the, uh, to the sort of... Uh, um, what is it, uh, uh, iconic um, homo uh, uh, social uh, desire song, um, YMCA. He's dancing away to this in front of an adulating crowd. Um, but as we're going to point out, I sort of, <laughs> uh, that the people who are following him likely are aim inhibited in important ways, and they found some way to put uh, Trump into the position of their ego ideal. More about that as we go. So the followers of, of this particular president, I've not seen this in my lifetime. Um, you know, I'm from the state of South Dakota. When I was a boy, um, you know, George McGovern uh, was a popular political figure, but there was never, you know, again, a, a kind of um, a, a man of the left, a liberal, um, had been a senator for many years, carried South Dakota values, uh, sort of liberal uh, Nordic values almost everywhere. Um, but but those values seem long gone, and in, and 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 instead of that kind of um, political uh, movement rooted in ideas and uh, reason and, and you know thoughtful policy and so on, we've got this kind of direct emotional tie between the follower and the leader. So Donald Trump seems to trigger this this emotive reaction. There is love flowing between, you know, the looks on their on the face of the followers. Um, uh, it's really love, right? I love you, says Trump, and the following reflects that love back. Now, what 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 Freud is going to say is problematic about this is that once people become formed formed into a crowd and they've had suggestions uh, given to them by the leader about what is acceptable conduct and not, that the crowd then becomes, um, it loses uh, qualities that we sort of need to have a reasonable society. The people who are massed in a crowd lose reason, 
Uh, they lose the capacity for critical thought. They lose the capacity to identify contradictions. They lose impulse control. Uh, you know, there's other qualities that go along with this. And you can wind up with human beings like this particular young man, who I, I, I can't quite remember his name offhand, has apparently regretted his actions. He claimed he was sort of caught up in the moment um, and that he wishes he were no longer the sort of the face of aggressive, um, you know, sort of stupid and aggressive white supremacy in America. He regrets this now. But, but, but if it's true that he wasn't quite aligned with the chanting of the crowd, but was just engaged in this behavior, this is what Freud thinks is important, is that people lose their individuality and simply become one of um, you know, one cog in a larger crowd machine, right? Okay, so uh, more of that as we go. So again, this is the image we're working on here. Freud believes that the, that the behavior of crowds is always, first of all, um, due to an identification between the follower and the leader. And even if the leader is not present, the followers are linked to each other out of shared love for a leader. Okay, and so that's what really is important. Okay, so the book Mass Psychology, then a few orienting definitions here. Um, the first one is mass psychology. It is not group psychology. Whatever it is that Freud is analyzing, it is not an organized group, like a work group or a family group or um, uh, in, an office or anything like that, or a bureaucracy. He's analyzing the crowd <clears throat> or a mass, right? An aggregation of individuals who really you know, lack a kind of structure. So the aggregates at issue are not groups as we usually define them. <clears throat> they're, they're aggregations of people that have no structure, no culture, no division of labor, no long-standing ritual, no moral order, right? They are simply an amassed collective, a collective. So a group here, I tried to sort of draw this on this margin sketch, you know, a group has a division of labor, sort of, um, you know, people who have fixed positions relative to each other, rights and responsibilities, a structure, they form a network, there's a culture, that kind of thing. Well, that's not here in Freud. Instead, what you have, what he's interested in, not that kind of group, but instead a mass, an aggregation, a massing of human beings together into a crowd, right? So this is covered in sociology, at least in American sociology, in what's known as the collective behavior tradition that studies crowds, mobs, publics, you know, political publics, that kind of thing. In this literature, in sociology, we often wind up with concepts about emergent norms. The idea is that, is that when people get amassed, they sometimes, it's whenever they stop just sort of randomly milling and begin to act together, it's usually a result of, of an emergent norm following um, or forming uh, you know, keynoting about what is going on, what the definition of the situation is, what each of us are, what our interaction status is, and so on. And that generates something called crowd or collective behavior, okay? So the first big point, mass psychology is not group psychology in the normal sense. It's, a, it's really a study of, of collective behavior and crowds and in masses of people. Okay, and you can be dispersed. It doesn't have to be, you know, people sitting at home all tuned into the same <clears throat> television program or watching the same, um, you know, social media postings are also masked human beings, right? You don't have to be physically co-present, although that's the ideal form. All right, the next uh, term, really fast. When, when Freud uses the term ego, he really means the I or the self. The German word is ich, right? So ego is the Latin. It really means persona, that kind of thing. And so if I were to retranslate the title of this book, it wouldn't be group psychology in the analysis of the ego. It would be mass psychology or crowd psychology in the analysis of the self, right? Of the social self, really. Okay, so, you know, Freud writes about the superego. It comes up in here just really fast. The superego, I want you to think of in, in this book, at least in the way I'm going to present it, as the sort of Lacanian big other. So the term that Freud uses is actually the German uber ich, which means sort of over I or over self, the, the, the self that's above the self, that's bigger than the self, that's comprehensively contains the self. So the superego, the big other, is the collective consciousness in Durkheimian terms that's operative in the self, okay? All right, and then when he uses the term instinct, which comes up a lot in here, I really want to emphasize that Freud is not um, using instinct in the way that that uh, that like a you know a biological scientist would do. You know, in in this wonderful book, The Language of Psychoanalysis, they have an excellent entry on Freud's use of the term instinct. He doesn't mean instinct. What he's writing generally is the German word Trieb, right, which means drive, organic drive. 
Pulsion is the French term. It actually is used in this book, Pulsion, towards the end of the book. Urge is, 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 is a decent substitute, a little too earthy. But um, it, I, I like organic drive, organic drive. It's a drive that has its origin from, you know, inside the human subject. It generally takes the form of pressure and energetic charge. So it has a kind of, again, a biochemical, uh, a bio, um, uh, you know, uh, in a, it, it, it has its origins in, in, in the organs and it's then directed outward towards an object. So drives always have aims. So again, instinct is a very poor translation of tribe, drive. Uh, to Freud from like 1905, the three essays on sexuality, he writes about uh, the drive having a source, which is generally, again, internal to the human being, but that's variable and developmentally uh, contingent, right? So if you're a young child, uh, the source of the drive is never the genitals. It's going to be like the oral regions, possibly the anal region, that kind of thing. Um, the object of the drive, the thing that the drive seeks to be satisfied, another human being, is always contingent, right? It's never something fixed by, by genetics or something. And the aim, you know, the, 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 the direction that the, that the drive it, it, uh, gets the, the, the subject to take is also variable as well. It's not fixed. So it's not fixed or determined by, the, by, um, by uh, instinct, any kind of ge a genetic or, or, uh, or biological uh, um, instinctual fixation. Instead, it's determined by the vicissitudes of an individual's biography. And of course, then as we get into the writings of like Wilhelm Reich and Freud here, there's a kind of typical structure in a society that leads most individuals down a kind of normalized developmental path so that the drives are something that are always socially structured. So Freud writes about these... Um, uh, that the somatic or organic drives depend upon the symbolic charge that creates erotogenic zones. And so the biography of the human being determines where those are located, but the structure of society itself and the normal sort of processual uh, development of the individual um, socially structured determines where those are. So drives are usually emergent or located or intensified in particular erotic, erotogenic zones that are created by the overriding of society, right? All right, so there's very little genetic determination in Freud, no automatic instinct at all, but again, the soma, psyche, socio con connections, soma, body, psyche, mind, socio, society, that the connections between the body, the mind, and society, contingent, right? And biographical and then socially structured as well. So Freud's psychoanalytic theories are profoundly sociological, profoundly sociological. Uh, and, and so therefore, infants in Freud are always thrice born. He actually uses this, this language to a degree in this book. It's never quite uh, specified, but in, in, in pre precisely this way. But the biological birth of the organ of the human being, um, you know, you come out of your... Um, into the world as an organic being of drives and the satisfaction of drives. Through the mirroring and recognition process with the mother, you develop an imaginary identification with a self. A psych that's how your psyche comes into being. So the psychological birth of the human being takes place in these intensive interactions with motherers, uh, right, where they mirror you back and recognize you, and that gives you a sense of self and imaginary identification. And then later on, as we've talked about, if you if you see uh, uh, any of the lectures on Durkheim or Freud, uh, like Freud's Totem and Taboo, the sociological birth of the human being takes place later. It's when the individual is installed through a rite of passage or initiation ritual into uh, the social structure, given a symbolic mandate with a symbolic identity, duties, and so on. All right. So Freud's essay then is a response to the traumas of World War I. I think that's why this book is written. And that's why really, uh, even though like, like Le Bon's book written in 1895 is before this, uh, Freud is really uh, caught up in the kind of immense bloodletting of World War I. I think a lot of his writings from the late teens uh, uh, on um, are dark. Uh, dealing with the death drive and other things, uh, because the uh, the problem of crowded mass psychology and modern advanced capitalism became ac acute during this era, collective hysteria, hysteria, hypernationalism, the eclipse of reason, and so on, the massive bloodletting of World War One. You know, really, we uh, there were about 60 million people killed in World War One. Um, a massive, massive, massive bloodletting. You know, over half of some parts of Europe 
half of the men were mobilized in the war. And in some parts of Europe, the death rate was, or at least a casualty rate was 25 to 30 percent. So half of the population of men being drawn into the war effort, all civilians ultimately drawn into it. And then this massive bloodletting, right? So it's really difficult for us to comprehend just how disorienting World War I was for European intellectuals like Freud, like Weber, like Durkheim. Um, you know, people were liberals or progressives, if not full on, uh, you know, uh, socialists. So it, it created this open wound in modernity. And, you know, I, I often teach a book by, um, I won't go into this now, I don't have time, but by, by uh, Stephen Kern called The Culture of Time and Space that deals with the World War I era. And, you know, he writes that in four years, the belief in evolution, progress, and history itself were wiped out, right? It was just this massive, this is my term, my language here, but there was a, that World War I ripped a hole in the fabric of space and time, broke down the sense of safety and security, normality was shattered, the speed of events was unprecedented really fast here, people began to live in a really thickened present, the past seemed in, impossibly distant, there was no future, so you're just living suspended in this incredible hell hole of the trenches and so on. Right. Um, and then space seemed to be obliterated. The front was massive in scale, global in scale, um, uh, rapidly shifting. And then he claims, that, you know, there was kind of a concentration of energy on these little patches of no man's land, uh, you know, on the Western Front in particular, these little spaces between the combatants. Um, and then, you know, he claimed that because of new war technology, civilians were no longer really civilians. They became kind of co-combatants, right? Bombings, uh, aerial bombings, a sabotage, terror, long range artillery, some of those massive, massive artillery um, guns that could shoot, you know, 5,000 pound um, uh, artillery um, shells you know, uh, something like, you know, a mile and a half in distance, right? So really a kind of a total breakdown of what was typically the difference between, um, you know, civilians and, and combatants. And so everybody became a co-combatant. So again, a massive rupture that the technologies and the kind of uh, uh, advances in culture of science and so on, that it seemed so important for um, um, the 19th century and seemed to create hope um, that a lot of that hope is sort of dissipated by uh, by Freud's time. Okay, so Freud then begins to book all psychology or social psychology, right? E everything, even sexual drives, he says, are ultimately um, social drives. You're actually always seeking another human being. So even sex, even genital sex is something that requires another human being. And of course, as he writes, you know, most of what we think of as as a sex drive, he says, isn't sex, you know, an infant doesn't have a sex drive. They, they have it. They have. Uh, they have something like an erotic life and something like an embodied drive. But it isn't for genital sex. It's for you know the comfort of the mother, for for milk, for oral uh, sensations, and so on. So Freud argues that the human being is the being of drives that's driven out into society. That the aim of the drives forces them to seek objects other human beings. So object relations is normally the way that we have come to talk, this is page four, to talk about beings of drive in society, human beings, right? We get into relations with objects. Objects are the others in our life who satisfy our drives or who realize our desires or trigger our desires in some way. So drives leads us to aim at objects. And then much of psychoanalysis deals with these most intensive, emotionally fraught relations with significant others, right? So the ego, you, the subject, have had a relationship with fathers, mothers, siblings, rivals, lovers, and so on. And you have this intensive relationship with the self, right? Narcissism. And that this is what Freud calls here in this section, depth psychology, right? Psychoanalysis, the depth psychology. We're not just looking at the, at the sort of the, uh, the relations that are going on in the moment, but you're looking at the kind of prehistory of the human subject. Each individual has formed what he calls an imago, at least this is from Jung, he uses the term in this book. An imago is a sort of a core primitive image of the primary relations of identification and desire that the human individual uh, uh, you know, um, builds in the course of, of development. So, so every current relationship for an adult is, is uh, impacted by this prehistoric past relationship with uh, mothers, fathers, previous lovers, siblings, and so on, right?
Okay, so Freud then opens the book by critiquing those who argue that crowds require us to develop a different uh, theory, a theory of mass psychology, that there's something new, that races, nations, castes, professions, institutions, that we become a component part of a crowd, of a mass of people, and that then people argue, like Trotter, really honestly Trotter, or heard his thing, it's sort of funny, right? Like all psychoanalysts seem to have funny names. Freud's name means joy, uh, which is kind of funny. Trotter, uh, you know, like, like a herd of animals trotting along, wrote the book about the herd instinct. So it's kind of funny here. But anyway, Le Bon, the good, uh, uh, wrote a book about the group mind. So at any rate, funny names. But, um, but, uh, but these theorists of crowd psychology emphasize that this is a new phenomenon when we require new concepts and new models. And Freud says, no, no, I can explain, he says, mass psychology using the same concepts I use to ex explain depth psychology or object relations. So here we go. So again, this is Freud. Mass psychology is nothing more than an aggregation of, of followers who have an emotionally charged relationship to a leader. Now, the leader is not going to be just a father, as he's going to tell us. Oftentimes, the leader is going to also include a kind of displaced, um, un realized, uh, unrequited uh, love that one had for another object. So there's going to be an immense amount of emotion flowing between the follower and the leader, but that the mass of the crowd is simply a group of people who recognize in each other a shared love for a leader. Okay, so there's Freud's basic critique. We do not need a new concept, right, a new instinct to account for the mass of the crowd. It's all about the identification with the leader. So as we're going to talk about, it isn't really about the relationships of people in a crowd to each other that's decisive to him. It's the suggestion in the identification between each follower and the imagined leader, and that the following that seems to form a crowd or a mass is then shaped by that. So here's where we're headed now. And so chapter two, Freud begins to analyze Le Bon's group mind. So I'm going to come back to this. Um, as our primary image here, but I just I sort of want to lay this out here, okay? So, um, so he's going to try to understand the group mind. So chapter two, he reads the 1895 book by Le Bon, and he extracts from it a kind, the kind of central problematic, all right? So he, you know, so Le Bon and other writers feared crowds. These are Frenchmen writing in the wake of multiple French revolutions that seem to always involve crowds. Um, and the basic argument is that individuality seems to disappear in crowds. Crowds seem to be human beings possessed by a group mind. They become something like, um, uh, in, so in other words, crowds or masses seem to form an immediate form of what Durkheim calls the collective consciousness. Something captures these human beings who cease to be individuals and become sort of units of a collective, right? So Freud is suspicious of any of these ideas, and he argues that he can explain mass psychology, crowd psychology, uh, with his already existing concepts. So page six and seven, there's three questions of mass psychology. What is a mass or what is a crowd? Number two, how does it control individuals? And number three, what is the mental uh, uh, change that is forced upon individuals by the crowd, right? What happens to them? All right, so what happens when individuals with individual psych psyches or individual consciousness are submerged in a mass or a crowd. All right, so there's three things that happen. So here they are, the list. So number one, the individual loses kind of conscious individuality, and that gets overridden by unconscious drives and impulses. So it, part of this language comes from Le Bon, but Freud cleans it up. So for, uh, Le Bon uses the term unconscious, but he doesn't mean the Freudian unconscious. Freud does. So there's a loss of individuality. Individuals become uniform, typical. They become one member of a crowd, right? They become uh, an example or an instance of the crowd rather than an individual, right? So there's an illusion of invulnerability which seems to emerge in the crowd, that the individual seems to be overpowered and, and, and seems that the crowd is invincible, so therefore they are as well. As long as they go along with the crowd, this is also part of the great fear that people have of the crowd, that they can be crushed if they go against it. So you lose conscious or conscience, individual conscious, as a check upon conduct, you lose responsibility and act irresponsibly. So Freud argues that the mass of the crowd, again, he cleans up this language, removes the repression of the unconscious, right? Unconscious drives and impulses that were repressed uh, and suppressed beneath conscious uh, control and conscience uh, becomes unleashed, right? 
and then um, and then um, and then reappear, and then yeah, the individual loses conscious control of the self. So that's number one. That so the number one feature: conscious individuality is overridden by the unconscious drive. The second feature of of the crowd is contagion. This is what Laban thinks is really important. That there's a kind of hypnotic phenomena of imitation that occurs, right? Where for some reason, without thinking, each member of the crowd mimics the conduct and behavior of their fellows. So sentiments and actions are spread across the crowd without friction, without any overriding personal individual consciousness. So this all seems to go away. Individuals sacrifice their individuality, again, to become an instance of the crowd. So for some reason, without even being able to explain it, you get caught up in this imitation of crowd conduct. So, you know, people who are in a crowd where the people around you are cheering will also begin to cheer. Uh, you know, those famous images of crowds uh, hailing Hitler with the Heil Hitler sign, right? Um, where there's this like an overwhelming a mass of people who engage in this. It's very hard to resist this. It seems like each individual, for some reason, suddenly has the impulse to salute or to, or to yell or something like that. And the images that we just saw, people screaming and yelling for their, their Fuhrer, their leader, Donald Trump, it's the same kind of phenomenon, right? There seems to be imitation or contagion going on. It's like a viral infection spreading from person to first person. Ironic, given where we're at. All right, the third trait then is suggestibility. And, he, and to Freud, this is what's important. It isn't contagion that really needs explaining. It's, it's suggestibility. And Freud is going to make the argument that contagion, the thing that the crowd psychologists like Le Bon and Trotter and, and others think is really important, is really a kind of side effect um, of, of, of suggestibility. So the suggestibility, Freud thinks, isn't accounted for very effectively by these crowd theorists. Instead, uh, they, they tend to emphasize, uh, uh, again, just contagion of person to person. That's why they need to have the concept of the group mind. And Freud just says, look, people are suggestible because there's a leader, a Fuhrer, and they essentially place the Fuhrer in a position of, of suggestibility. All right. So on page 11, he talks about hypnosis and suggestion, which is foreshadowing where the book goes. The leader of the group, the crowd, excuse me, the crowd, the leader of the mass, the leader of the political following, essentially has it, places himself in the position of the hypnotist and becomes, uh, and the following then becomes hypnotized to a degree and, and under the sway of suggestibility. So there's the three things, disappearance of conscience, dominance of unconscious personality, contagion and suggestion. They become impulsive. So there's a contagion of feelings um, and ideas in an identical direction, uh, right? So the members of the crowd aren't just milling around doing what they want as individuals, but they become sort of locked into formation and have identical direction of their uh, drives. So um, this transforms uh, the suggested ideas into acts because there's no sort of uh, reflection. It's all impulsive. The individual is no longer himself, becomes an automaton, and cease to be guided by an individual will so they become a member of a group. So on page 12, Freud argues that the people who become caught up in the crowd um, essentially begin manifesting atavistic or regressive behavior. I want to look at this passage because it's really important. Let's read it. Um, by the mere fact that, this is page 12, that he forms part of an organized group, uh, and this is actually should be an unorganized group, a man descends several rungs in the ladder of civilization. This should, it should be unorganized group. This should be a crowd, an unorganized group. This is a mistake. So this should be a crowd or a mass. So that you form a part of a mass. You're not an organized group at all. You're a mass. You descend several rungs in the ladder of civilization. You, uh, isolated, you might be a cultivated individual, but in a crowd, you become a barbarian, a creature acting by instinct, possessing spontaneity, violence, ferocity, the enthusiasm and heroism of primitive beings. Okay, so that's Laban. Um, and so let's look at some of these side uh, uh, traits. I won't read it, but let's just sort of look at the list that I have uh, written here. Um, I hope these are somewhat readable. So that's it. The, 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 so the other traits, the main ones, the unconscious dominates, the conscious self is dimmed. You have contagion or imitation, apparent imitation, person to person, and suggestibility. The other traits then are regression. Uh, you act primitive or bar barbaric. You become stupid, violent, and aggressive in a crowd. Um, uh, members of a crowd become impulsive. The crowd is impulsive, and so are the members. They become uninhibited. Um, 
they, they're, un, they're omnipotent, a feeling of overwhelming power. Nothing can hold them back. They're not constrained by almost any force. Um, uh, they, they are, there's impaired reason. Um, they're incredulous. They're very suggestible, incredulous, and there's no contradiction. There's no capacity to recognize that ideas don't add up or suggestions go in opposite directions. So you can be told in the same second uh, or two phrases back to back that are completely contradictory, and the crowd is unable to contradict those things, right? So just like the unconscious, which knows no contradiction, just like a psychotic who knows no contradiction, um, the crowd knows no contradiction. So this is really impaired thinking. And by the way, this is one of the main reasons why crowds are and, and masses and political followings that depend upon crowds and masses are so dangerous for democracy. Reason goes away. Group think in the form you know in, that that Irving Janus talked about takes over. People aren't thinking as individuals with reason and thought and reflection. And so instead of getting human beings aggregating and developing a superior mind, we get human beings coming together and downshifting to stupidity. You can get a crowd that's actually dumber than its dumbest member, right? That's less intelligent than its less intelligent member. That's more aggressive than its most aggressive member and so on. So feelings and emotions become exaggerated and simplified. So, so again, you get more anger than the most angry person. You get this sort of... Uh, um, a fantasy and illusion are, and an image are much more important than ideas. So groups, uh, excuse me, crowds and masses aren't governed by reason and thought and reflection. They're governed by illusion. There's an enemy, get them. There's someone coming to get you. We've got to go get them. You're the greatest. I'm the greatest. The other people are awful. These just basic fantasy illusions of, of, of enemies that are, that are about to, uh, you know, threaten our existence and so on. So groups become very, uh, excuse me, masses and crowds, very intolerant of dissent. You're absolutely afraid if you're a member of a crowd to descend, dissent from the crowd's opinion for fear that you're going to be attacked by them and you will be attacked, right? The crowd tends to go after that. I've seen this in Trump rallies, many of us have, where someone in the crowd will call out something like, I disagree with you, or they'll make some protest statement. And Trump will simply say to the crowd, Go get them, smash them, hit them. Uh, I can't remember what the right terms is. Like, I'll pay your legal costs. Knock them around a little bit and toss them out. And so they can't tolerate dissent, right? And so there'll be people thrown out of there. So they become very obedient to authority, right? Obedient to authority. They're very conservative, uninhibited. Um, I'm going to read that section about authority, uh, which is on page uh, 17, I think it is. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, so a group is obedient herd which could never live without a master. It has such a thirst for obedience that it submits instinctively to anyone who appoints itself as master, right? That kind of thing. So um, earlier on page 14, he says that groups like this respect force. Um, they're obedient to authority. Uh, they respect force. Uh, they can't be influenced by kindness, but only by violence. They demand violence. They want violence. Uh, people within them become uninhibited and so on. They're very uh, uh, conservative. They tend not to like innovation or new things. They tend to grab onto the old. So you'll find that masses, political movements that depend upon massing, that depend upon crowds, tend to reinforce traditional values. And, um, and then uh, Freud writes that, that, again, that they're often can be quite moral, that the crowd can actually be altruistic because in many ways, in Durkheim's terms, Crowds are altruistic <clears throat> because they override the individual self, the ego, and you're really overridden by a collective consciousness. The crowd is altruistic, so it can be self-sacrifice, and the individuals can easily sacrifice themselves uh, within. So they can be very violent and very immoral in that sense, but really the kind of moral temperature tends to be raised. Uh, he also writes about the magic of words, that whatever goes on in a crowd, when the leader speaks, the leader speaks with words that are taken to be magic. That's page 16, right? So uh, so they don't, they use illusion, they demand illusion, masses do, crowds do, they can't function without them, it's going to be important later. So imaginary fantasy, not symbolic reason, that's what matters. So when words are spoken by a leader, they tend to be virtue words, propagandistic phrases, and so on, rather than thoughtful reflections, okay? So again, a political movement that uses thoughtful reflection in words isn't a mass. A mass 
political movement um, um, is, is what Freud is writing about here. Okay, so crowds and masses then, again, are an obedient herd. The traits of the leader, this is on page 17 on, um, they tend to operate, they're very authoritarian, they're power-driven, strength, power, strength, power. So again, in our image that I was just showing from uh, yesterday, the sick Donald Trump who has coronavirus uh, illness right now um, is projecting this sense of strength. The other day he posed, uh, get, they propped him up in a chair somewhere and he scratched his name on a blank piece of paper and then the image was put out, something like Donald Trump, the strong man, uh, is resisting, you know, and is so strong that he's able to resist the virus and is able to work through the virus. Even though, again, if you look close at the piece of paper it was signing, it was blank and empty. So here, again, he's projecting strength, even though we know he was wheezing, he should be having a mask on so he's not infecting other people and so on. But he, he is so embedded in the notion of strength. So the political following for Trump is a mass in the sense that, or a crowd in the sense that Freud is writing about. The leader, strong, projects strength, dominant, violent, that kind of thing, and, 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 and fears projecting weakness, okay? All right, so he writes about this in the terms of prestige, prestige, uh, a kind of mysterious power that seems to be conveyed by the leader. It really is exactly the parallel to what Max Weber calls charisma or charismatic authority. So prestige, charisma, magic, otherworldly power depends upon success. If the leader is unsuccessful or weak or sick or ill or a failure, the charisma goes away, the prestige goes away, right? So even though there's some resistance to abandoning the leader, the leader begins to be abandoned by the following when weakness is displayed. So crowds demand weakness. A political following rooted in masses demands a strong authoritarian leader. Okay, This becomes really essential to the mass psychology of fascism and other writings in the Frankfurt School who are analyzing Nazism and authoritarianism in, say, you know, fascist uh, Italy. All right, so chapter three, then he moves on to other accounts of collective and mental life. These other theorists like Trotter, McDougall, who writes about the group mind in 1920, the main ideas are wherever you get a mass or a crowd, you get two phenomena, an increase of emotional reactivity, impulse, emotion, really strong, and a decline in intelligence. So wherever you have political movements rooted in masses or crowds, you get emotional reactivity, strong hate for the leader, strong hate for the in-group, and strong, excuse me, strong love for the leader, strong love for the uh, in-group, and then immense hate for out-groups and immense hate for enemies, right? So you get this pumping of hate, an exaggeration of hate and an exaggeration of love. And then you get a decline in intelligence. And again, in a democracy, we, tend, we depend about voting and, and reason and, and, a, and, a, and a public who understands issues and so on, making informed choices and informed voting. The decline of intelligence is really problematic, okay? So any democracy should be deeply troubled by political movements that are rooted in crowds or masses because it undermines the kind of, you know, John Deweyan, uh, you know, Dewey's ideas of democracy depending upon inquiry and thoughtful reflection and so on. All right, so so page 21, he writes about uh, McDougall's group mind. And again, McDougall clarifies and Freud affirms this or endorses this, that masses and crowds are unorganized groups. Um, and they always have an intensification of affect um, and again, a kind of a compulsion uh, and so on. I'm going to skip a lot of that. There's five conditions that McDougall recognizes that could dispel the uh, negative effects of an unorganized group. Freud mentions these. I teach these when I teach organizational theory. So if you want to reduce the emotional reactivity or increase the intelligence of a group, you simply organize it in a bureaucratic or Durkheimian way. So that means that you create a continuity of existence. The crowd and mass doesn't just come together for a, a rally, but it exists after the rally. Each member should comprehend the group's purpose and its structure. It has The group should have relations to other groups, that there's a sense of responsibility. There's traditions, customs, habits, and culture, a kind of group memory. So it's not just a rally in the moment, but it, it, it goes on afterwards. There's a definite structure uh, with a division of labor and so on. So you organize the group, and if you organize the group, you wind up getting um, the negative effects dispelled. 
okay? So you have less contagion, less suggestibility, less domination of the unconscious, less emotional reactivity, and less stupidity. Okay, so then we go on to chapter four, suggestion and libido. Okay, so in this chapter, Freud is going to uh, make the, he's going to go back to that main argument here. I'll try to keep the image in front of us. That the core to understanding a crowd or a mass is to understand the relationship between the leader and the follower, which is one of suggestion. So Freud says, where does the suggestion come from? The suggestibility, it comes from the leader. So the leader becomes the decisive agent in formations of masses. And if you want to understand a mass, you must understand the mass, excuse me, the follower leader relationship. So that's where this goes. So, and again, Freud is going to say, look, all object relations, all of them, the relationships to fathers, to mothers, right, to lovers, um, to authority figures, all of these things are infused with strong emotion. So there are two emotional ties in Freud, and this is where this is going to go in the next couple of chapters. The two emotional ties are identification and desire. Yes, sexualized desire even, right? And that those are the two main emotional ties. So if a leader is going to have influence on a following, if there's going to be a, a, a kind of psychic connection between them, there must be an emotional tie. So that's where this goes. In chapter four, then, Freud writes about libido or emotional ties between uh, people. Uh, so why is there decreased intelligence and increased emotional activity? To Freud, it's all about the suggestion. It's all about that the contagion of individual to individual isn't as important as the suggestibility uh, of, leader to lead, uh, of leader to the crowd. So instead of thinking about a crowd or a mass as a wheel where you get each individual member conta contagious, infecting the others in imitation, uh -uh. he says it's really the, the leader at the center who sends out spokes of suggestibility that determine the following, the way that the following thinks and the way that the following operates. And the following, in order to be influenced by the leader, has to have libido, emotional tie, connecting uh, uh, the, the following to the leader. So page uh, 29. So suggestion then is rooted in uh, libido, in organic drives. We talked about this earlier. Um, um, and objects. So all social, all, all drives, all libido, all sex drives, all embodied drives ultimately are social drives in Freud. So to Freud, again, it's a sociological theory of the human subject. You're not just a being of, of organs, but, you, but the human subject becomes embedded in a society. You're drawn out to objects. Those objects are structured in a social, uh, social structure. There's a language and law, a symbolic order. So any drive, even a sexual drive, is social, right? It's social. It leads out to social objects. So he, and he talks about love and the language that we use to talk about love and how it means generally both erotic love and something like agape or care, other things, right? So page 31, love is the binding force in the crowd, and it relates the leader uh, to the followers, right? And it is similar to being in love. So that's where this is going to head now, right? being in love. So he's going to try to explain that to us. So before he does that, he's going to look at two artificial groups in chapter five, the church and the army. And his, 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 his claim is very simple. An army and a church seem to be, and by, seem to be uh, again, crowds or masses, but both of them are actually led by a fuhrer or a leader of some kind and that each of the members of the church or each of the members of the army is determined by their psychic relationship to the leader. So that's what he goes on. So the church leader, and now he's going to come up with this, this prime, this must be present. A leader of a church must love all of the followers equally, all of the members of the congregation equally. He talks about the Pope. The Pope loves all Catholics equally, right? All people equally. So there's a fundamental illusion of equality of love, equal love, right? The leader often is not an actual father or doesn't even pose as a father, but rather as an elder brother, brethren, sisters. He, you know, so you know, many religious movements use that, right? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Many pietist movements in Germany explicitly use that language of, of the brethren, right? Um, um, you know, uh, and so on. So, so, um, so these religious movements, church movements, um, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It is our love for Jesus and our love for the Pope who loves Jesus and our love for each other because we all love Jesus, right? That that generates 
uh, the following. And so it is the leader to follower ties that then generate this notion of brothers and sisters in Christ. So the emotional bond between the members of a mass or a crowd is, it is love. And that love is ultimately um, formed first between the follower and the leader. And then each member of the mass or the crowd recognizes in each other a shared trait, a shared quality, the shared love for the leader, okay? So the military leader is the same, although here he claims that, that the military leader is actually a follower and that all followers in the military are equally comrades in arms. That's crucial, right? So the band of brothers, again, is a language that we often use to refer to members of a, like, like a, um, a unit in the military. Uh, and, and, and again, they're united in love for the leader and, um, and then the love for each other is a kind of mirror reflection of that. So both of these uh, uh, groups then um, are held together ultimately by the leader-follower relationship, on that, and which is libido or love. Okay, and then page 35, he argues, look, there's no wonder that a member of a crowd or a mass loses individuality and loses individual control of conduct. They lose freedom. Freedom is vacated because of the double bonds between the follower and the leader and the follower and the fellow travelers, right? That the follower to follower relationship, um, yeah, yeah, and the leader to follower relationship doubly bind, right? You're doubly bound and fixed into location and fixed into place. So you can't really express individuality, individual thoughts and feelings and so on, but you're really locked in to um, expressing the leader's opinions and the following's uh, responses, mi mirroring those. So he talks about uh, the importance of the leader here by uh, talking about panic, and about what happens when a group loses its head, loses its leader, it often disorganizes or disintegrates. So if that occurs, if crowds and masses lose their organization or their apparent organization, their order, if they disintegrate uh, when the head is lost, then that tells us that that head is really important and really, and really, uh, really matters. Okay, so uh, the next chapter, further problems and laws at work here. He talks about emotional ambivalence. I really want to emphasize this. In Freud's work, including in Totem and Taboo and everywhere in Freud, um, uh, every object relation that we have as human individuals, every relationship we had to other human beings, every relationship we have to valued social objects is infused with emotional ambivalence. So what is emotional ambivalence? It's a mixture of love and hate. Both valences, both feeling states are present, right? And then we know in Totem and Taboo that, that one feeling state is conscious and one is unconscious, right? So you love your totem or your authority figure and secretly hate it, and then you secretly love the objects that the authority figure tells you not to touch, but you have to overtly and consciously hate them. So you get you have both valences and that society really is all about fussing with that ambivalence that people feel, okay? So what he claims is, is that the key to understanding the bonds within a mass, the bonds within a crowd, and to understanding mass psychology is to understand that with that this is a structure that fusses with it, interrupts the ambivalence. So you get a suspension of hate towards the leader, and you get a suspension of hate towards the people who are amassed in the crowd. And so it's all love all the time, right? It's all love. You love your leader, you love your crowd, you love. It's all about love, right? It's all about love. I love my leader. I love my leader and we love each other. So you watch a tra Trump rally. I, I encourage you to do it. And what you're going to see are people who are expressing positive emotions often, right? Incredible energy, love, happiness. Their leader is there. They're in the presence of the great one and they feel infused by that presence. They're, they're in the presence of the one they love, right? The problem then is hate. Because the group is bonded together in love, the ambivalent emotion, the second emotion of hate then, has to go somewhere. And so massed political movements project the hate that they probably would otherwise feel towards the authority figure in their midst or towards each other that gets projected out as hate towards enemies, right? All right, so that's what happens. So, so why, do, um, why, does why, do why does mass psychology bind people together so strongly? 
is because people are doubly bound in this conscious need to express love for the leader and then love for the fellow travelers. And you get locked into that experience of love. And the fact that you're repressing hate for both your fellow traveling members of your crowd, who you don't like, who likes these people, or, or, or for your leader, who the heck likes someone like this, right? That has to be repressed, and that repressed hate actually fuels the love and fuels the bond uh, within the group, okay? All right, as we're going to talk about. All right, then he moves on to chapter 7, where he talks about identification. All right, so if the leader is, so if the follower is suggestible, it's because they have love for or identification with the leader. So the follower is suggestible because they identify with the leader. So how does that work? So again, Freud then distinguishes on page 46 and on the two emotional ties. Um, so this is Freud's theory of repression and sublimation of sort of, of, of emotions as, and, and of drives, right? And of desires. It's the repression of drives, the repression of desires, that that is what makes society. So social ontology, right, the kind of theory of the nature of society, what is society made of? Freud argues that society is ultimately made of repressed and unrealized, unrealized drives and repressed desires, right? That's what it's built of. And that repressed social energy, right, then gets inverted and played with and is made sublime in a variety of ways, right? So society is in system of blocking, uh, capturing human energy, right? Drives and, and desires, and then playing with those things because it's blocked, you then get it back in a distorted, displaced way. Um, and, and so he had, really has here a theory of sociogenesis. The origin of society occurs when drives are blocked. He doesn't really develop that fully until the very last chapter, a kind of postscript to the book, where he goes back to the myth of the death of the primal father, something he talks about in the book Totem and Taboo, where he claims that society originates when the primal father is killed and where we begin to honor the dead father as an ego ideal. Okay, more on that as we go. All right, so what happens? So, so gosh, should I walk through that? Yeah, I think I better stick to this piece first and then we'll go to the picture. All right, so there's two emotional ties um, and, and the human subject comes into the world as a baby who has, who has not yet differentiated these two um, emotional ties. That the, the infant is, uh, comes into the world under the care of mother errs, a mother or mother errs, right? And it isn't until later in life that, the, that identification and desire, these two emotional ties, become separated or divided into different objects. They don't even become differentiated from each other within the self. So initially, the infant is attached, the, the infant ego is attached to the mother-er through a mix of identification and desire. And he actually, in this piece, places identification first. And so identification, he argues, is actually a kind of oral incorporation or oral introjection. So what the mother, so what the infant does when the infant identifies with the mother or desires the mother, the infant actually incorporates the mother uh, and takes the mother into itself. Incorporation, right? And that's called introjection. So, so that initially is what happened, and then as the child develops and matures, they begin to realize that the mother isn't in them, the mother is out there as well. And then at the moment of Oedipus, right, the Oedipus complex occurs, and the resolution of that then, uh, at about the age of, say, six or so, you get the differentiation between identification uh, and desire, right? So the way that this works is that at a certain point in development, the infant begins to separate out identification and desire. They begin to realize that the mother is separate from them and that there's a difference between identifying with the mother and desiring the mother and then at a mother or and then at a certain moment, right, six or so, when you're divided and taken away from the mother and installed within the big other, like a school or an apprenticeship or something like that. When you go through an initiation ritual, you get a new name and a new identity and a set of symbolic mandates. When that occurs, you then uh, you split 
and you renounce, you tend to renounce the object of your desire, the mother, that kind of, kind of, kind of dormant, uh, but but she still be, remains as a kind of object. We're going to use that term. It's not actually Freud's term, but we're going to use it. The mother remains as a kind of manifestation of the object ideal. Even though you renounce the mother as your object, you maintain her as a kind of rough draft or sketch, a kind of primal image of woman, if you're a heterosexual boy, that you will desire later. So your desire continues in sublimated, aim-inhibited, sublime form towards mother. You don't really desire the mother's body anymore, but you desire the image of the mother, that kind of thing, or the idea of, that mother represents. And then you get identification with the father. So you renounce the mother, and then you begin to identify with the thing that the mother desired, which is the father, right? So you identify then, identification, so, so this, the, the heterosexual boy at the, resolves the Oedipal conflict or complex by incorporating the punitive father inside of the self as an ego ideal. So here's the term, an ego ideal, all right? So this is a heterosexual boy. The father threatens to castrate them. If they don't give up the mother, they give up the mother who then becomes an ideal, not an actual body, but an ideal. And then the father becomes a representation of the ego ideal, of what, of what the, 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 the boy identifies with and would like to become, okay? So you identify with the father by incorporating the an image of the father into the self as an ego ideal, and then the mother becomes an object ideal, the, 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 where you direct love and that kind of thing. So the object of identification, the father for the heterosexual boy, has a wish to be the father, be that identified object, and, uh, and again, we're going to drop object to just be identified with the father. And then the object of desire is the thing that you wish to have or to possess. So you want to have or possess, right, uh, the ego ideal in ideal forms, and you want to be like. So you like to be like the ego ideal, and you want to possess the mother earth. Okay. All right. So um, does that make sense? So it probably doesn't. Um, on page 48, Freud makes another pass at this, and he argues that in identification, the subject molds their own e ego into the form of the other, right? The other is taken as a model. So the ego says to the ego ideal that they're identifying with, I want to be you. And then he has this bizarre section. I call it the section of the three coughs, right? There's three coughs that he analyzed. And each of them, each of these different coughs, um, repre <coughs> represents a different form of identification. All right, so I wonder if we can walk our way through that. Can we, should we do it really fast? I think, yeah, so this is page 40 on, page 50. So, so and maybe I'm going to just tell a little story, and I'll, I'll just do it verbally rather than walk through. So there are three patients that Freud is dealing with. Patient one is a woman. I'm going to make this up. I'm going to, I'm going to augment it, punctuate a little bit for effect. Let's say all three of these patients manifest something like tuberculosis symptom or maybe COVID symptom, if you want to use that. Coughing, they're coughing, right? There's a cough. And there is no biological cause for the cough. They've gone to a doctor, they can't find it. So it's the patient sent to Freud because the cough seems to be psychosomatic. Patient one is a woman who is coughing and as it turns out she has the woman this young woman has developed object desire for her father who's become an object ideal right and has identified with her mother so you know the the girl goes through the edible complex in a slightly different way uh, than the boy so that again for the heterosexual boy you identify with the father desire the mother for the heterosexual girl, you identify with the mother and desire the father. Okay, well, that all happened in a normal way. However, um, yeah, however, she, for whatever reason, felt such strong desire for the father, continued to feel it, this young girl did, young woman, that she actually wanted to take the place of the mother late into life. And she became somewhat aware of that and that her identification with her mother was so strong that she wanted to take her place that her mother had tuberculosis and was ill. And she developed the symptom of, 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 of coughing, 
right? She mimicked or, or, or some or other incorporated her mother's illness. So she identified so strongly with the mother and wanted to take her place that she then, um, that, that, that the desire for the father that was manifested in her strong identification with the mother took the form then of her developing the mother's cough. So she became suggestible by her mother who became way too overloaded with significance for her, right? She wanted to really take her place. And so this is uh, identification uh, in the kind of normal way, the primal emotional tie with an object, okay? The second form, the second patient, number two, is the patient Dora actually has a name here. And in that case, the young woman had the sort of normal idea she'd taken her father as the ego ideal, but, or excuse me, as the object ideal, but she had developed an overstrong identification with him. And she wound up, for whatever reason, becoming so completely, uh, in other words, her drive that she felt, her sexual drive for the father was still there, but she had to be completely shut down. And that fueled this incredible transformation. It's like the desire the ego, that, that the father was the object ideal, but also became then the ego ideal. She began to identify with him as the object ideal and, and as the ego ideal. And so the father winds up replacing the mother in her mind as her form of identification with, the, with incredible strength. And then so the father was ill and coughing, so she develops coughing fits as a result. So here she becomes suggestible. She takes on the traits of the father um, because he has been placed in the position of the ego ideal. So the mother's gone, and instead of the mother, who should be her ego ideal, she has the father, who was her object ideal, who becomes her ego ideal as well. So the point is, is that the person she should desire and keep separate from her as desire, somehow or other gets incorporated within her. So you've got this really, really electrically charged object who now is inside the person with massive judgment and massive weight and massive control, is actually doing reality testing. More on that in just a minute. Telling this subject what's real or not, and she develops this, uh, this suggestive uh, 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 cough as a result. The third form is the reciprocal form. This occurs, uh, so he, he talks about, I think it's a hypothetical case, it might be a real one, of a patient who is at a, at a girl's school, an all-girls boarding school, where sort of like the queen bee girl that everybody admired uh, is rejected, gets a letter of rejection from her boyfriend, and she gets ill as a result, gets sick, begins coughing, and then everyone else, the other girls in the school, begin manifesting coughing behavior. One of them winds up as his patient. And the reason that the girl coughs is because she has identified with this other girl who lost her boyfriend and she recognizes that they have a trait in common, a shared desire for a boyfriend. So she doesn't have a boyfriend, but she wants one and she wants to be in the position of this girl. So she identifies with a girl who shares this common trait, right? So she has the same desire for an object that this other girl does, hence you get um, coughing. So we have the three coughs representing three different modes of identification. So what is a cough? A cough is a symptom, a suggestible thing. You have a person who doesn't just have an idea, but actually manifests behavior, medical symptomatic behavior as a result of identification with an other. There are three others. One is the identification with the ego ideal, the mother is ego ideal, kind of a normal thing that results from an overcharged desire for the father that leads the girl to want to replace her mother. So in all three of these modes of identification, there's an, a kind of a surplus energy that's generated because the separation of, of desire and identification is broken down in some way. And so you get this surplus charge that the desire that should go to an object outside of the ego winds up going into an object of identification. And that object of identification then can attack the ego, can overwhelm the ego, can take over the ego and so on and deplete the ego. And so, and so the ego becomes dependent in some way upon that overcharged object of identification. Does that make sense? So, so, so there's three forms of this. One, again, the, ident the cough of the mother because you over-desire the father and that, that, and that leads to this overcharging of identification. You want to take the mother's place, the cough. Number two, you get the regressive replacement for a, prime, for a, um, 
for a previously desired and abandoned object choice, right? So you desired the father, but you had to give up the father as an object choice. Um, and, and, and so you can't have that, but that charge, that energy charge was still there in Dora's case. And so the desire became sublime. It became so strong that the father wind up overwhelming her, her identification with her mother. And she became strongly identified instead with this sole object, this father who is not only her object of identification, but her object of desire. So really, really powerful desire there. Okay. And she developed a father's cough. And in the third case, it's that reciprocal uh, person to person transmission of contagious desire, right, uh, in, in the form of coughing, because there was a recognition that 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 subject and other subjects share a common trait, a, uh, a common desire, and hence the coughing spreads. So it's the cough of the of the uh, crowd in the. Uh, in the uh, in the group, right? So again, in all, and so Freud writes that for all of us, our primary for the for the heterosexual void, the primary identification is with the same sex parent, the father. Uh, for the heterosexual boy, the uh, the ideal object, the primary object choice is the mother or mother er, and then that generates what's called the imago, right? The imago, um, which is sort of again a kind of rough draft. Um, uh, a, a kind of an initial channeling of emotional ties later on in life. Okay, all right. So, so Freud is going to tell us that 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 desire is a very powerful emotional tie, and so is identification. And that if identification gets mixed up in some way and gets some of the energy that normally would have been channeled into desire. If that gets if that gets blocked, then you get this hyper ignition of of identification. All right. All right. So Freud is going to argue really fast on page about fifty. He argues that that the that in a crowd or a mass, the primary um, problem for the follower leader relationship is the first two. Either you're going to simply have identification with the leader. And you're just going to have block drive and gen in general in life. So you're going to have an over identification and desire to take the place of the leader. So let's say that you're, um, you know, we if you all know about the incels among the uh, the the uh, the alt right or the new the new right wing in America, right, the new political right, the incels, involuntary celibates who are angry because they can't find a woman and tend to be very misogynistic as a result of this. So these are men that do not have the ability to have their drive uh, satisfied. So, they, so they, they can't discharge the energy of drive because they quite honestly aren't, these are men who quite honestly don't have sex partners, right? And so we've heard about this, right? There's this bizarre thing. So many of the people in the far right today, the, the, the new right, the alt right, are people who neither have sex partners nor do they masturbate. There's like this bizarre anti-masturbation uh, uh, movement as well. And so that means drives are never satisfied or discharged. So that energy that would normally find an outlet doesn't. And so that means that that energy then, if there's no object of love, that energy then winds up being placed upon the object of identification. So you get a kind of over erotic charge from the follower onto the leader, right? An over erotic charge. Okay. And then the other way is if you Again, it, where, where the desire for the other becomes so strong that it winds up again get, getting displaced. You displace the normal object of identification out completely, and instead, the, the this incredibly strong unrequited love for an other becomes the thing that you identify with. In either case, you wind up with the emotional tie of desire being welded onto or intermixed with the emotional tie of identification. This leads to this, again, this kind of hypercharge. Um, and then again, to Freud, there's no wonder why you would become suggestible and you would become a kind of hypnotized subject under the sway of this incredibly charged uh, object on the other side. So to Freud, the object relation between leader and follower takes on this form where the leader has too much energy, kind of surplus energy, um, that the blockage of the discharge of energy 
has been so complete that the follower becomes latched onto psychologically and identified. It begins to form themselves into the model of the um, of the other in a way that's that, that's that's a bit perverse. And then and then number three, the follower to follower linkage, right? The linkage between the men with the tiki torches, right? Uh, the men with the tiki torches, again, so I don't know this about these men, but what Freud would say is that these are men who are not satisfying their sexual drives. They don't have love objects or they're not realizing uh, sexual satisfaction in their love objects. So the energy that would normally be dispelled, and plus when these anti-masturbation incel movements, involuntary celibate movements, and so that energy that would normally be discharged in normal love relationships, loving uh, women or loving other men, if they're gay, whatever it would be, right? That isn't being discharged. And then that energy is being stored up and then being discharged in these expressions of love for their fellow travelers. We love each other. We dress alike. We, we, we all have the same tiki torch and we all chant the same anti-Semitic slogans. And so, so you, you discharge that energy that would normally be dispelled in love relationships and sexual relationships, right? Normal activities of adulthood. And that energy isn't being discharged, and instead it's being directed uh, in love for the crowd or for the mass and hatred towards those who don't, uh, who don't align with it to the enemy. All right? So Freud then argues that this is where 